Ten years ago when I started using the robot, uh, there were just a small handful of general surgeons that uh, were really kind of wading into these waters and trying to figure out where it was going to be useful, and we really had no idea. Uh, we had no idea what the future would hold for robotics and general surgery, and so we had no idea what we were missing. But over the last ten years or so, we have uh, thoroughly explored uh, the use of robotics and cholecystectomy and really discovered the value, and that's what we're going to talk about today because if you're not using the robot for cholecystectomy, you just might not realize what you're missing. My pathway to robotics uh, began in 2009 when the first robot showed up at our hospital that the urologist wanted to do prostates. And um, the intuitive folks came to me and they said, Dr. Gerhardt, you're the minimally invasive surgeon in town, uh, you should use the robot. And I said, I'm the minimally invasive guy in town, I don't need a robot. So I started out really as somewhat of a naysayer, but I wasn't happy with the single incision laparoscopy that I was doing for gallbladders, so I thought maybe robotic single site would be useful. So I got trained and started doing multi-site robotics uh, until single site was available. And, and uh, back then we thought big complicated machine for big complicated cases. So I started doing Nissens and gastric bypasses because there was a lot of sewing involved and the risks we figured would you know help us sew more efficiently. And, but I started doing other cases as well and started to get excited about it. And then in 2011, I became a total practice robotics enthusiast because um, I started to experience what the robot could really do in my practice. And I'll tell you, I, I just dove all in on one day, uh, and I, I remember the day like it was yesterday. Uh, I came in to do a Nissen, and the OR director said, you can't use the robot today, the urologists have it. And I said, I don't care, I'm a laparoscopic surgeon, don't really need the robot. And so we started operating and set up the laparoscope and the slave cameras and all that stuff. And and I'm um, operating along and I'm looking, I'm like, the vision that something's wrong with the TV, uh, clean the camera. So they cleaned the camera. And, and uh, so I'm working along and I'm a little more, a little while later I'm looking and it's like, it's, it's just not right. Something's, something's frustrating, don't understand. I'm like, tell the staff, you know, put some anti-fog on the, on the scope, there's something wrong. And they do that and I'm working some more and I'm, it's just not right. And I'm looking at this TV across the other side of the bed and, and finally I say, look, guys, get Biomed in here, adjust the color bars, fix the TV, something is wrong. And finally the OR tech had had enough and she put her hand on my arm and she said, look, Dr. Gerhardt, there is nothing wrong with that image. It looks that way every day you're just not in the robot room. So on that day, I became total practice. And I decided if I was gonna be operating in the abdomen, I was gonna be operating from the console. Because really, at that time, it was vision for me. Was, I could see better, it was 3D, it was bright light, high def, um, and more than that, I controlled it. So I could look right where I wanted to look at every moment of the case, always in the center, always where the light was brightest, always where the focus was best. And I became so excited about that um, in 2013. I wanted to teach others and uh, have uh, told the, the benefits I've experienced and taught others how to use it in general. Uh, until uh, now, when uh, my practice uh, really looks like the full gamut of general surgery and bariatric surgery um, being done robotically. Now, your pathway to robotics uh, will probably look a little different than mine. Um, and in fact, we recommend you start with less complicated cases and work your way up. Um, so inguinal hernias, uh, some ventral hernias, cholecystectomies, get really good at using the technology with some of these higher volume cases, little less complex dissection and things, uh, before you move on to bigger cases like bariatrics and complicated nissens and col colectomies and things like that. And if you do it that way, you'll be able to really ramp up through your learning curve safely and efficiently, get good outcomes from the very beginning, um, and really improve patient care, because that's what it's Intuitive is going to help you with their ecosystem, where they provide, of course, all of the technology that we've come to expect, and they're going to give you lots of training opportunities. Uh, there's courses you can go to, conferences like this one, obviously, and lots of other training 
uh, resources that you should take advantage of. And then they're going to give you support through analytics and monitoring your, your practice, and not only your practice, but your hospital, so you can develop your program along the way. One thing we really found in my practice uh, was that cholecystectomy really helped form a foundation for the entire practice. Uh, if you see when I got started back in 2010 and 11, as I said, we, were, we weren't really doing the smaller cases. I was kind of doing the bigger cases um, and got off to a slow start. And then in, later in 2011, where I really decided to start using it for everything, uh, we discovered that not only did increasing the number of cholecystectomies improve, but that helped ramp up all the other general surgery that I did. So it really formed a foundation for me and my practice. And that was true of our other surgeons in our hospital too, as they in increased their cholecystectomy, other less complicated cases. It really improved all of their other robotic experience as well. So I would like to you know, help you experience that same kind of success in your program uh, by integrating robotic cholecystectomy into your practice. So first we're gonna talk briefly about how. How do you do a robotic cholecystectomy and go over some quick tips uh, so that you can see how it works in everyday practice. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about why. Why would you wanna do a robotic cholecystectomy when lap coli is a pretty good case, right? I mean, you know, you know it's uh, minimally invasive, it's good outcomes, quick recovery, things like that. Why add a robot? We'll talk about that. But let's start with how. So OR configuration is very easy with the XI. You put the robot anywhere. So it can go on either side of the patient. You can spin the boom that all the arms are attached to. Placement of the robot is really about what else is in the room. So where are people, where are cords and uh, medical oxygen supplies, things like that. But anywhere it fits in your room, uh, you can put it uh, to approach the Port placement is uh, really pretty easy with the XI2. It's just a straight line. So you're going to take a perpendicular arrow to that straight line and point it right at your site of dissection. And then you can just spin that straight line around the abdomen to point at wherever you're going to work. For the cholecystectomy, that line is just going to be tilted toward the right upper quadrant. And you're going to put your robotic ports about 20 to 25 centimeters away from the site of dissection. That's where the, the robotic arms work best. Um, you don't want to be too close to your site of dissection. Um, and for me, my fit spread fingers are about 23 centimeters. So I put my pinky on the site of dissection where my thumb falls. That's where the uh, line of the ports goes. Now in reality, um, I'm going to not use exactly a straight line for cholecystectomy. That left upper quadrant port site, we're going to move just a little bit up in the air uh, to get it a little bit further away from the camera and just give it a little less clashing of those two arms. So we're going to start by putting a blunt tip optical trocar in for our mid right upper quadrant port. And that's gonna be our initial entry and then we're gonna leave that there for our assistant port. So then we'll, with the camera through that port, we're gonna look over to put the uh, robotic camera port in and then put in the two operating ports after that. So you can put all of the robotic ports in under direct visualization. Then if you want, you can use all four arms for the robotic uh, procedure by switching out that initial uh, port site. And in fact, I would recommend you do that as you're learning so that you learn how to use all four arms. And that's going to prepare you for those bigger cases. All right, let's look at a, a, a case. What does this really look like in real life? This is a completely unedited video. You're going to see the whole thing from start to finish. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit so we can feed it, fit it in. So you're going to start off by uh, handing the gallbladder to your assistant so they can hold it up for you and then uh, take a quick look with Firefly, get a lay of the land, just see where the ducks are so you know where to start heading, um, and then start the dissection. So you can see we're using the uh, hook as the dissector. The grasper in my left hand is the force bipolar. And uh, you'll see uh, it has two gripping strengths so it holds really well, plus it's bipolar. So when you get a little bleeding like that, you can quickly zap it and keep going. 
Um, we're going to dissect posterior to the cystic duct, take a quick look with firefly, make sure there are no aberrant ducts. That's a common place for them to show up. Now we know nothing is uh, out of uh, normal, so we're just going to keep working. And that is one of the nice things um, about firefly in even a straightforward case like this one. It's just going to keep you moving. Uh, you never uh, are wondering where the ducts are. You can go right after the important structures. Uh, and here we see the cystic artery uh, coming out into view. Uh, the hook is wristed, so it can really get around structures very nicely, much nicer than the straight uh, stick laparoscopic uh, options. Um, we're dividing a little bit of the cystic branch, uh, cystic duct branch of the artery to open up Kello's triangle there. And we're going to encircle that cystic artery. And then we're going to move over to the uh, dissect the inferior third of the gallbladder from the liver bed. And that's going to complete our critical view of safety. Quick look with the firefly shows the cystic duct has ICG in it uh, and the artery does not. So those are our two critical structures in plain view. Uh, we're going to use the plastic WEC clips. They have a lock on them, so they are very secure. Uh, much more secure than the, uh, than the metal crimp on clips uh, we've used laparoscopically. Uh, you just have to make sure there's no tissue in that lock or it will pop open and fall off right in front of you. Um, but once they're locked, they're locked and they stay in place. So a clip here on the artery and then we're going to take a quick look with Firefly again. Just make sure we're not missing anything. Everything looks what we, the way we expect and then we'll divide the structures. So we're going to divide them with the cautery so we don't have to open up a scissor. The hook has cut and coag modes on it just like a cautery pencil. So you can cut the structures with the cut and then use the coag to look up the duct, up the liver bed. Quick look with Firefly to make sure the clips are secure and not leaking on the duct and there's no ducts of Lushka draining in the liver bed. And then finally we're going to amputate it and be done. So that's it. You just watched an entire cholecystectomy start to finish unedited. That's how they can go. So we've looked at the how. Now we want to look at the why. So we're going to talk about why. What, what benefits does the robot bring me? And as we go along, I'm going to ask you another question. I'm going to ask you, why not? So I already told you that the first real big benefit that I noticed was visualization. So I went from being a laparoscopic surgeon, then getting used to the 3D bright light, high def camera image. And when I went back to laparoscopy, I realized what I was missing when I was doing laparoscopy. And now I have this great image, the best in minimally invasive surgery. Not only is it a great image, but it's stable. It doesn't twist around while your assistant is talking to the other people in the room. Uh, and you control it. So you're always looking where you want to look the entire time. It's not twisting. You're not operating in up top in the left corner. You don't have to tell your uh, camera holder, what are you looking at? I don't see my instruments. Do you see your instruments? You never have to uh, have that conversation again. The robot will hold it very secure. So I have to ask you, if you could have great stable image, why wouldn't you want that kind of visualization? Another thing is con control. And the thing that is really going to give you the control of this operation is using all four robotic arms. And we call it the third dissecting arm. So you have your two primary left and right hand, plus you get a third one to retract. So you always have the tissue right where you want it. So in the gallbladder, you're going to retract the top of the gallbladder, move it back and forth, up and down, left and right, just the way you need it for dissecting. And then on bigger cases, like on the right of the screen here in a sleeve gastrectomy, you can actually retract the fat from the greater curvature while you're retracting the stomach using the vessel sealer to walk up between your own hands. And if you can see how that works, it's, it looks like a three-armed surgeon with all of those arms working efficiently. So if you had that kind of control of an operation available to you, sitting there ready to use, why would you come to the OR and say, no, nah, I'm not going to use that? 
Now, advanced instrumentation is the obvious answer for why the robot gives us advantages over straight stick laparoscopy. All sorts of graspers, staplers, the needle holders we talked about really does make this a great sewing machine for you, and then all sorts of devices. So let's look at a couple uh, specific to gallbladders. Um, one is bipolar energy, especially on the Maryland dissector. So bipolar energy is so important to me as I practice because you can do things like stripping with bipolar. So if you see in the video, we're desiccating the tissue, the little fibers as we peel them off and that helps you peel apart fibers. And of course the Maryland uh, has a full wrist. So not only does it have a little bend to the tips of the jaws, you have a full wrist to get in and around structures like the duct, the artery in this operation. Great control, hemostasis plus great dissection. Another bipolar instrument is the force bipolar. So that is medium grip strength that you see on the left and high grip strength that you see on the right. So one instrument, two different grip strengths. Um, and you can see the medium grip strength is atraumatic. It will let go if you're pulling. Uh, and you, if you wanna put it on high grip strength, you can grasp things more securely. Two grip strengths plus bipolar cautery. Just a very versatile uh, piece the Cobra Grasper is the grasper you want to reach for when you've got the toughest gallbladder to grab. So this porcelain gallbladder filled with stones, the Cobra Grasper has teeth on it very much like a coker clamp. So this is a absolute traumatic grasper that to grab the worst things and it will allow you to hold and retract and stabilize the, the worst. One of the best instruments for really bad gallbladders is the wristed suction irrigator. So you control the movements, you have the wrist, plus you control irrigation and suction so you can keep a clear field. Do blunt dissection, do hydro dissection, really helps you in these difficult gallbladders. So with all of this great instrumentation available, why would you not want to use it? Why would you want to say, no, I'm going to use the old stuff today? Let's just let the more advanced stuff on the shelf. Efficiency and reproducibility is another thing that the robot will help us with. Now, certainly efficiency is really in the hands of the surgeon, right? So um, you have to be an efficient surgeon, and that means you're well-trained and you have experience, and you've got to do that with the robot too. You've got to get training, get experience. But you have to remember, no matter how good you are, you're a long blue cable away from the bedside. Um, and that means the bedside people have got to be good too for you to be efficient. So they have to know what they're doing when the arms are clashing to get them to work. They have to be able to put instruments in and out efficiently um, and deal with problems so that you don't have to go to the bedside, scrub back in and fix things that kills efficiency. So you might be the best robotic surgeon in the world, but you won't reach full maximum efficiency if you don't have a great team alongside you. This is definitely a team sport doing robotics. So you can be efficient with the robot. Uh, if you look at my OR times for all comers, so easy ones, hard ones, about 29 minutes incision to close. We also compared all of the surgeons at our hospital robotic to laparoscopic and about the same time, 35 minutes, 34 minutes. So not a big difference. It doesn't have you to slow you down compared to your laparoscopic times. Now, many people are surprised by that because they think, you know, well, you know, when I do laparoscopy, I put the ports in and then I operate. And with the robot, I got to put the ports in, then dock, then operate, and it adds a step. So it must take longer. Well, you, when you really get your team together and trained, you can make that docking only three or four minutes and the benefits that you get with the control, the better visualization, the better instruments, adding efficiency more than makes up for that couple minutes uh, and more some of the time. So we're not the only ones who have shown efficiency. Dr. Caravella in Las Vegas has uh, shown similar uh, operating times and an interesting thing here in his uh, learning curve numbers. The first 25 cases did take a little longer, 
um, and that will, you'll experience with most people because that's when you're learning to use the machine and the equipment. Uh, and then in the next 25 cases, you're learning uh, how to uh, do the choreography of your procedures, what the steps are, how the robot affects them, what instruments you use when. Um, and then after you get up to that, you know, kind of important number of 50 cases, uh, you really are getting back your efficiency and you're no longer worrying about how to use the machine. You're just coming in and doing your case and experiencing the benefits of the robot. Now, unfortunately, over the years, We've seen a lot of surgeons kind of get in and do a handful of cases that in that early learning curve and they say, yeah, you know, it slows me down and they've walked away from robotics. And that's unfortunate uh, because they never got to the point where they really uh, understood it enough to be good at it, to experience the benefits. So they missed out on what they could be experiencing. So now that we know that robotic cholecystectomy is something you can do efficiently, um, it's really not something you want to walk away from. Adding quality to cholecystectomy is something the robot can do too. Now uh, research is showing it. Uh, this paper has shown improved outcomes compared to laparoscopy. It's shown less conversions compared to laparoscopy. This is absolutely true. Uh, in my practice, I can't remember the last open cholecystectomy I've done because opening doesn't help you. Um, you get less uh, bright light, you don't get magnifications, um, and you already have wristed instruments uh, just like your hands that you can do most things with. So there really is no reason to convert anymore. Uh, and this paper showed safe outcomes. So we're not adding uh, morbidity or mortality, we're improving. Why can it be more safe? Well, a big reason is firefly fluorescence imaging. This is where you put ICG, endocyanine green dye, into the vein, into the bloodstream. It attaches to albumin, which gets taken up in the liver and excreted in the bile. And it is nearly 100% bile excreted. So um, that's gonna light up the biliary tree. Uh, the ICG dose is five milligrams typically. I have seen anywhere from two and a half milligrams to 20 milligrams, different surgeons using. Um, you have to put it in about 40 minutes before you need it. So uh, it takes that amount of time to go through the bloodstream, get to the liver and get metabolized into the bile. So this is something you gotta give well before the operation and you can't wait until you got a bad gallbladder to put it in in the OR. I don't know any surgeon who's going to sit in the OR and twiddle their thumbs for 40 minutes and wait uh, while the ICG gets to the liver. So you got to give it before. Um, and if for some reason your team doses the ICG and then the case gets held up for whatever reason, uh, the ICG is going to last about three hours. So you got a big window for it to work. Uh, one thing to remember, uh, Firefly is a cholangiogram. It's putting dye into the bile ducts, um, but it's not an x-ray cholangiogram. An x-ray cholangiogram gives you a, a one look, a roadmap at the biliary tree. This is gonna be more like GPS. So when you're driving, you're driving looking out the windshield until you get to an intersection, you say, which way do I go? You look at your GPS and you figure it out, then you make the turn and you continue driving, looking out the windshield. Same thing with Firefly. Um, you're gonna operate under white light until you need to make a decision. Then you're gonna flip on the Firefly. It's gonna help you decide what to do. Then you're gonna go back to white light. So let's look at it. This is what it looks like. Uh, first you get in there, take a quick look, just get a lay of the land, see where everything is. Then you're going to start dissecting. I think this is the cystic duct. Flip it on. Yep, that does. Let's look behind. Make sure there's no aberrant ducts. Wait, what is that? Oh, something's back there. Um, in this case, it turned out to be a uh, branch of the hepatic duct, uh, of the right um, hepatic duct. Glad we know it's there before we went diving into that area. Um, operating on the a short cystic duct or cystic duct uh, common duct junction. Um, that's precarious if you don't know where those ducts are. Getting an injury there is difficult uh, to deal with. You're also going to see a bunch of anomalies that uh, maybe you haven't seen before. Um, uh, the anterior spiral duct is interesting. The cystic duct actually crosses over and enters the medial side of the common duct. So now that 
duct up in Collot's triangle is actually the hepatic duct. So uh, that is a dangerous situation if you don't know it. The new endoscope, uh, Endoscope Plus, has even higher definition, more clarity uh, to the firefly with less background uh, glare from the liver. So you see the Endoscope Plus on the right uh, and the, uh, the previous one, the standard one on the left. So it's getting even better. In fact, it's, it's bright enough and clear enough that you can actually operate under firefly. So when you're in a difficult uh, gallbladder and you really need to keep an eye on your ducts, uh, maybe peeling the gallbladder off the common duct or something, um, you can actually keep your ducts in view through the entire uh, portion of the procedure by operating under firefly. So since you have to put the firefly in uh, ahead of the operation, it's going to be on every operation. But, but that's okay because you're going to use it on every operation. It's going to keep you safe from anomalies. So it's just like you would never send your 16-year-old kid out to a new driver and say, look, just, just wait till you're about to get in an accident, then put your seatbelt on. Well, that's the way Firefly is. Firefly is the seatbelt you wear every time you go in to do a cholecystectomy, and it's going to help you every time, making you more efficient, making you aware of abnormalities. And uh, also some papers to support uh, quality and safety. Uh, this one on conversions to open. So this uh, showed that robotic cholecystectomy with ICG can reduce uh, conversions compared to laparoscopy. Uh, SAGES came out with safe cholecystectomy program recommendations to reduce uh, problems, improve safety in all cholecystectomy, so laparoscopic, open, robotic, uh, and they give us some guidelines that the robot will help us attain. The first one is uh, to use the critical view of safety, so that's where you dissect out the hepatocystic triangle or Collot's triangle and get all the fat and fibrous tissue dissected. Uh, the lower third of the gall gallbladder is dissected off of the liver to make sure nothing's back there, no other ducts or arteries. And then at, at the completion of the critical view of safety, you have only two structures, one duct and one artery going in, into the gallbladder. Um, the visualization and control and advanced instruments that the robot provides us will certainly help us accomplish that goal. Also helps with uh, recommendations three and four, which uh, make sure we're staying alert for aberrant anatomy. Uh, Firefly is going to help us visualize that and accomplish recommendation number four, which is a liberal use of cholangiography. And recommendation number six says get help from uh, other surgeons. So if you're really uh, in a tough situation, tough dissection or other difficult conditions, uh, you can actually get help now. You could get help from an outside uh, surgeon uh, via telestration who could look right into your uh, console and see what you're seeing, make recommendations. Uh, or you can invite another surgeon in uh, to operate with you at a dual console and actually help for the operation. So stay tuned uh, for uh, next uh, talk 12.5 uh, where we're going to really dive into some difficult gallbladders and find out ways to accomplish them safely. So why wouldn't you want to use all of those great advantages for the robot? Well, um, there are some tough things uh, that are obstacles to using the robot for many of us, and those are cost and access. So let's look at how we can overcome those and deal with those very important issues. Um, cost is certainly important. We've been looking at cost all the time we've been doing robotics, uh, making sure we're um, not adding a tremendous amount of uh, money to uh, the procedures. Um, and we've compared our uh, cholecystectomy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the way I did it when I was doing cholecystectomies laparoscopically to multiport um, uh, robotic cholecystectomy, the way I do it. And these are the instruments we use. Uh, and there is only about a difference of $133. So it's not thousands of dollars more per case like some people think. If it was, that would be prohibitive. Um, but you can get the cost down um, uh, and make it really very simple. One way Intuitive has helped with this recently is by the Extended Use Instrument Program where uh, they've been able to uh, manufacture instruments to be used more than 10 times. So, 
Most of the uh, instruments up until now have had 10 lives. So you buy one instrument, use it 10 times. So you divide the cost of the instrument by 10 to get the uh, one case cost. Now, if you're dividing that overall cost by 12 or 14, 15 or 18, of course, it's going to be less per case. And they didn't do this just by changing the number. They have actually uh, improved the reliability and the performance of these instruments and help them stay uh, strong during reprocessing and sterilization so they're actually able to last longer uh, and that's helping us save. Uh, in our institution uh, you can see cholecystectomy saved about $182. These are our real numbers based on extended use instruments as well as reducing the cost of all the other common robotic procedures I do. Um, for most people, you can expect savings in the range of 9 to 15% somewhere, depending on which instruments you use and, and uh, for what procedures. One of the best ways to save money is by reducing uh, the instruments that you use. Uh, we talked about the force bipolar. It has two different forces plus cautery. So if you would have needed to switch out to a different grip strength instrument, uh, you've saved that amount of money by not having to open another instrument. Uh, we also talked about the hook, using it to cut the duct so that you don't have to uh, open a scissor. Um, and then switching out, uh, instead of using four arms, just uh, using three and using an assistant port will save you the amount of money of that uh, robotic instrument that you would have used in that position, so some $200 or so. One of the best ways to reduce costs is to increase your volume. So use it. Use it and get good at it. Uh, this uh, series of papers in General Surgery News uh, reviewed uh, an article that showed higher volume hospitals and higher volume surgeons reduce costs, as well as length of stay and morbidity and all sorts of things that also cost money. So the more you use it, the better you get at it, the lower your costs. All right, let's talk about access. So access is a, a big problem. A lot of surgeons I train around the country say, yeah, well, you know, I'm new and, and I don't have any block time, so I don't know when I'm going to do it. Well, block time is tough. That's kind of the biggest obstacle for many surgeons, um, and it's complicated. It's kind of like a three-dimensional chess game because you have to overlay your OR day, your uh, room time, you got to get the right room available, and you've got to get a robot available. So your schedulers have to kind of overlay these three schedules uh, to, in order to accomplish block time. So it's tricky um, and it's tough. The reality is you got to fight for block time. Uh, in every hospital I've ever been at, nobody just hands it out generally. Um, you you got to fight your way in, uh, and hopefully it doesn't come to actually fighting in the hallways, um, but it does come down to some heated discussions sometimes, um, and unfortunately, uh, many times the relationship between hospital administration and physicians is kind of like a tug of war, and it, and it really shouldn't be that way, and one of the best ways to get around that is the robotic steering committee. So this is where robotic surgeons and administrators and the OR staff and anesthesia, all the key players, sterilization people, uh, all get in one room and discuss their priorities. And then you can compromise and work things out. When it comes to discussing block time, um, that means looking at real data. So you can go to a surgeon and say, look, you're, you're only using your block time 30% of the time. So we're going to take some of your block time and give it to one of the new surgeons who need time on the robot. And it's much easier to have that conversation with good data and a group of people agreeing on it. A big part of access is having uh, the robot and staff available 24-7, so all the time when you need it. At our hospital, we've worked hard to train people. Uh, certainly our 7 to 3 crew is fully trained. We have a 9 to 5 to, uh, to kind of overlap to see the daytime cases get finished up, uh, and we have 3 to 11 people trained as well. Those people all are the same people who take shifts on the weekends, so we typically have uh, a robotic team on the weekend too that we could uh, do robotic cases. Now, this is kind of tenuous um, and it takes a real commitment from the OR to train people because 
As soon as one person leaves from a team, you don't have enough people to fully staff the robot and you've lost access for that shift or that day. Um, and this is a real kind of ethical issue for me because if I tell patients that this is the best care I can give you from seven to three, uh, on Monday to Friday, and then I tell a patient I'm going to do it with lesser equipment and a, in a less lesser way on off hours or off days, that creates a little bit of an ethical dilemma for me. So I really want to give the best care all throughout the schedule. So over the last 10 years, uh, we have really discovered the benefits of robotic cholecystectomy, and we discovered what we were missing when we only had laparoscopy. And if you are currently not using the robot for your gallbladder surgery, um, hopefully this discussion has kind of opened your eyes a little bit to what you may be missing. And those benefits, uh, as we said, are the enhanced vision and control, the advanced instruments that uh, are available, uh, the fact that you can be uh, efficient with the new technology, uh, and we've documented quality and safety with the new devices. And you can reduce cost and improve access, but you do have to work at that. So whether you are starting your robotic practice or whether you stopped and are restarting, uh, cholecystectomy is a great procedure to use as one of the foundational procedures on which you build your robotic practice. And just as we close, how do you do that? Again, you advance up through um, less complicated to more complicated procedures. Get to know the resources that are available to you. Uh, first of all, your intuitive team and all that they supply through their ecosystem. Lots of videos and procedural resources through intuitive, but also through YouTube and uh, social media, other places. Um, and reach out to your robotic surgical community, your peers locally, regionally, nationally. Um, there's lots of people willing to help you. Um, and you got to learn the technology. You got to take the time to learn, you know, how does the robot work? How do the instruments work? Um, how does Firefly imaging and the different uh, imaging modalities work to really understand it and get good at it? And then track your data. You know, know your results so that you can make your decisions based on your data. You know, you don't have to rely on what other people are telling you. What works for you, you'll understand. And I can't emphasize enough, this is a team sport. You gotta get a team involved around you. That means making sure the pre-op people get the ICG, the right dose, the right time. Your OR staff, they have to know how the instruments work. They gotta be able to put them in and out, exchange them efficiently. They gotta be ready to retract or suction, do other things. Um, even changing the trocars. You know, again, if you gotta go back to the table to put a trocar in to put your fourth arm in, that's really inefficient. And clips can be the bane of this operation. If your assistant is putting in the arm and dropping clips and you gotta go retrieve them, that's tough. Make sure you got good staff. And remember the extended team outside the OR, that's your robotic steering committee. That's really a team that helps administrate this and makes it a strong program overall. And finally, commit to the technology. Begin with a series of 25 cases. That, that's how long it's gonna take you to really learn to use the arms and the foot pedals, get good at that. Then you've gotta do some choreography, learn which instruments you use, when and how. Um, and when you get to that 50 cases, you will be back at your efficiency. And when you show up in the OR, you won't be thinking about the robot anymore. You'll be thinking about the case and how the robot is helping you. So we've learned a lot over these uh, 10 or so years of using the robot for cholecystectomy. We've really gained a lot of advantage that we never knew about. Um, and if you're not using the robot for your cholecystectomies, you will be missing out on all of those great advantages. And you know, I encourage you to try it out so you can really experience the enjoyment and the success that I've enjoyed over these many years. Thank you.